So you see the, the politics is more intense on the Thai side than the Cambodian side. For the Cambodians, uh, whichever government they had in the past, they would have tried to list uh, here as World Heritage Site. Uh, but for Thailand, if you had the Democrat government, they would oppose it. Uh, Thaksin's government uh, went along. In fact, in 2008, when Foreign Minister Nopadon signed this joint communique, his argument was that the joint communique only w would only allow Cambodia uh, the listing of the temple, but would leave the 4.6 square kilometers adjoining the temple as negotiated uh, land to be negotiated. So that was his defense. And you know we've had such turmoil from this. Uh, it's become a saga. 2006, we had a coup. 2007, we had a coup-inspired constitution. We had ele uh, election 2007, Thaksin's government through Samak uh, 2008. It was the timing also was problematic for us in Thailand because at that time they were looking for ways to bring down that government. Uh, so, for example, disqualifying Samak for a, a cooking show, right? And then uh, using this uh, temple dispute, the joint communique, as treason, as another plank to, to destabilize and, and de depose uh, the government, which they succeeded in doing. So that set up 2009-2010, the Red Shirts. So now we've come uh, to another round. I do think that the various players will think twice about going through this again. So the question for us today also is, you know, is this case uh, I think, by the way, that the more ambiguity we have in this verdict, the better. If it's clear-cut, it may not be so good. Now, whatever happens, if it's a clear-cut decision against Thailand, there will be rumblings and turmoil, no doubt. Would that be enough, would there be enough turmoil to derail the Yingluck government like they did in 2008? Now, this is the question for us. Uh, and I tend to think that a lot of people would think twice. Do we want to go through 2008 again? For those of you who are not here, 2008, 9, 10, very uh, tumultuous time for us. Uh, I think they will try. I, I don't think they will have enough traction. Uh, we saw last year the Pitaksayam didn't find much traction. This year, if the decision goes against Thailand, the 4.6 square kilometers go to Cambodia, there will definitely be uh, problems, but enough to derail the government. Uh, not as much as in 2008, because, as like I said, I don't think Hun Sen will make it worse. Uh, but this is a big, big question mark. Now we come to the last speaker, and I have to ask Ambassador uh, Luffy to uh, to help us uh, uh, see the regional dimension here. Look, since ASEAN became ten members. The Thai-Cambodian border clash, this is an armed confrontation. It claimed, inflicted more than a dozen casualties, a dozen lives were lost. They had about five serious skirmishes. Uh, Thailand used cluster bombs, reportedly, against uh, in, in, the, in that area. And the Cambodians mobilized uh, artillery on both sides. ASEAN, as uh, John Wittich has mentioned, has been ineffectual. Not just on this issue, but you know, confrontation between uh, was it uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thai, Cambodia is not being resolved by ASEAN mechanisms. And when ASEAN did try, Indonesia is the most is the largest member in ASEAN, has a right stature profile to be a mediator broker. Uh, and when Indonesia was chair of ASEAN, it tried to intervene uh, to mediate constructively and was rejected. And there have been no ASEAN peacekeepers, no Indonesian peacekeepers. There, were, there was an agreement, but in fact it has not been followed through. Uh, so from Indonesia's point of view, as a most, the largest member and the most prominent member, uh, how could ASEAN help and what role would it could Indonesia play in this uh, border dispute, Ambassador? Before. Let me strike to the points. I'm not going to repeat again what, where this uh, root causes came from as we have ex uh, speakers before me. But uh, of course I'm going to put um, 
uh, how to call Indonesian perspective on this by also putting in ASEAN context because uh, ASEAN has been there for 45 years since the beginnings uh, it's already set up a kind of uh, principles and so on and so forth but again allow me for a few seconds to bring up against about the regions before ASEAN was born because if you if we want to appreciate the progress that ASEAN has made during its inceptions about 45 years and then look at look at our regions before ASEAN was born everybody knows in the history the region is one of the most infected conflict in the world you know what I mean this is just a kind of a, how to call it the illustrations the facts historical flag, facts about our regions before ASEAN was born so at that time of course ASEAN's our regions is a kind of marked by conflicts related to territories this is a part of the history historical legacy as well Indonesia Malaysia Malaysia Philippines and on those also in these regions in in, in in Thailand and you mentioned about Cambodia of course Laos Myanmar and so on and so forth and then the regions also was under the proximity the proxy wars during Cold War West and East we have Indochina war that's also causing a lot of uh, um, problems in our regions Indonesia in this case also um, should take care of hundreds and hundreds of thousand of what people during this time there is a kind of suspicious and lack of trust among countries in the regions we have numerous regional organizations that proven to be failed and then at that times many countries in the regions relatively new we are they are facing about the process of nation building. So of course excluding Thailand has, has never been experienced colonizations but almost I think probably all of the countries in the regions experiencing colonization Indonesia alone is under Dutch colonization for around 350 years so based on these facts our leaders probably at that times think enough is enough it is time to come together to sit down and there where they come to Bangkok and declares that the region is going to be associations of Southeast Asia by five founding members at that times Thailand Malaysia of course Singapore um, Indonesia uh, and also Philippines so in the very beginning of this it is very clearly say that the objective of ASEAN is to accelerate the process of economic development to promote peace and stability in the regions but at that times the focus of cooperation on economy until and then at that times also the mechanism is very low only in the minister levels it's not come up to the interest of the, the leaders at that time only about 10 years later for the first time of ASEAN summit in Bali in 1976 Indonesia I mean start to to consider to bring political security issue in this in this particular sense. so let, let me a little bit mention or bring up to your attention the principles of ASEAN when it was declared 1976 basic principles is there even at that times our leaders ASEAN leaders at that times already predicted the world is going to be increasingly in the independence world that's why at that times it is time to promote regional cooperations that is peace progress and prosperity this is in 1970s a very noble objective of ASEAN and then it's very clearly defining from the beginning that to promote regional peace and stability so ladies and gentlemen only in 1976 we start to bring the discussions 
political security issue and at that times we managed to reach what we call Treaty of Amity and Cooperation where the conducts the basic principle of conduct among member countries of ASEAN and, pre and at that anticipating the involvement of major country outside of ASEAN. That's why that at the moment so many countries now try to uh, accept a Treaty of Amity and Cooperation also. So let me quick because you know this is uh, the time constraint. So at that times we pass on the Bali Concord where it is clearly defines the basic principles of conflict settlements. If you look at in the principles, it is very clearly defined that about if we have a conflicts, we need to settle our differences through peaceful means. It, it is very clear in the Bali Concord about settlements or differences or dispute by peaceful means. Even it was mentioned also the renunciations of threat of use of force. This is the principles, the, the, the beginning of ASEAN's inception. Now ASEAN move ahead and then we have now a chapter. It's a bit uh, more advanced at the moment because very clear defined that it is new political commitment by ASEAN's member countries. It is a legal framework and legal personality. It is a kind of ASEAN norms, rules and values set a clear target for ASEAN and present accountability compliance and that has entered into force by December 2008. So in these charters also very clearly defined the reliance of peaceful settlement of dispute is in the charter of ASEAN. And some highlight about the chapter 8 about settlements of dispute. It consists of general principles, good offices, conciliation and mediations, dispute settlement mechanism in specific instruments, establishments of dispute settlement mechanism and compliance. This is all included in the charters. Now, how Indonesia come to this issue? As we mentioned before, that ASEAN during this conflict happens was a chair of ASEAN. That's why we, we try to be a good and responsible and reliable chairman during the ASEAN. It is therefore, we want to see the chairmanship not just only a kind of uh, annual rotation of, 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 of chairmanship, but we need to have a kind of substance in that. So we need to have a continuity and always re-emphasize, reiterate our commitment to the principles that we have agreed upon previously. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the factual events about Thai Cambodia border dispute. As I mentioned before, the border clash occurs on the 4th and 7th February 2011. Although the professor before me has mentioned that in fact the conflict is not the state. It's about the interests of certain groups. But you deploy artillery and then the bullet, bullets come out of the, 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 the barrel of the guns of the state institutions. This is a state conflict. This is the fact. And it is therefore ASEAN, as a chairman at that time, traveling around to appeal and to ask the conflicting party to turn to the principles of solving the problem through peaceful means. And then that time also, Cambodia, Cambodia bring this seat to before Security Council of the United Nations. That was 14 February 2011. And then we have a BOGO meetings, Indonesia facilitating this, joint border commissions, but again, it wasn't successful enough. And unfortunately, the second class, the, the second conflicts occurs by 26 April 2011. That cannot avoid the fall of the victims, of course. So as a chairman of ASEAN, of course, they have to present the ASEAN views before the Security Council. 
That's why during this uh, deliberation, Unity Council, 14 of March 2011, the Foreign Minister makes statements by saying Indonesia believe that the ultimate leader exists. It's a recognition, an acknowledgement. Exists a continued desire and commitment by both sides to settle their differences through peaceful means. The effort done by UNSC is consistent with the basic understanding of ASEAN member countries have made as reflected in the Treaty of Amity Cooperation and ASEAN Charters that have been mentioned before. Indonesia believe that both sides recognize the need to stabilize the situations on the ground to ensure the ceasefires hold. The third one is a need to build more reliable local and higher level communication systems between the two sides by taking into account third party support to ensure that the ceasefires holds. So this is some kind of testimony acknowledgement by foreign ministers at that time as the chair of ASEAN in this event. What's the response of United National Security Council at that time? It's very clear to say that Circuit has expressed their grave concerns about the armed clashes between Cambodia and Thailand, call on two sides to display maximum restraint, avoid any actions that might aggravate the situation and stabilize a permanent ceasefire, resolve the situation peacefully and through effective dialogue. Security Council therefore support the ASEAN active effort and encourage the party to continue to cooperate with ASEAN and welcome the ASEAN Foreign Minister meetings. So we have this also uh, 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 meetings within the ASEAN frameworks by formal, I mean, uh, Foreign Ministers of ASEAN to 22nd February 2011. This is to further discuss the Thai Cambodia border situations and to discuss regional international focus. So result of the meeting, of course, against Thailand, Cambodia express commitment to each other and to, uh, to ASEAN to avoid further armed classes. Thailand, Cambodia agreed to resume their bilateral negotiations through joint commission of the Marquesan of Land Board. So the bilaterally also there is a strong commitment to do this. And then even at that time, it, it is bring to the attentions of the leaders during the summit. That's why another, another effort that has been tried during the chairmanship of Indonesia through the summit on May 2011. At that ASEAN summit, there was a communique statement issue. I quote it, that emphasized the underlying norms and principles of ASEAN differences, that member states should be, amicab should be amicably resolved in the conflicts in the spirit of solidarity. Welcome Cambodia and Thailand commitment to peacefully resolve their differences through political dialogue and negotiations. And then of course appreciate engagement of Indonesia current chief of ASEAN. In this, regard, in this regard, appreciate Cambodia and Thailand have agreed on the context of the terms of reference on the Indonesian observer teams. And then the last part of the statements, of course, express the appreciation and support for the continuing effort of Indonesia current of ASEAN to facilitate the process through its appropriate engagement. So from this perspective, Indonesia do this is to carry out the mandate within the frame of ASEAN. Because I noticed here, because my, my office got the, got the demonstration at the time protest, if Indonesia really is, you know, just, uh, doing this a lot. Indonesia initiatives as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a single entity. But we need to make it clear that it's within the frame of ASEAN because Indonesia has a very strong commitment to use all ASEAN mechanisms for peaceful settlement. So, and also, of course, the case everybody knows we're talking about the case has been brought to International Court of Justice. And at, have, uh, at that time, uh, discuss again on the 18th of July 2011. And then, as you mentioned by previous speakers, the ruling of ICG mentions among other things that where the courts, not the security councils, 
on 14 February, which I already mentioned before, call for a permanent ceasefire to be established between the two parties and express its support for ASEAN in seeking solutions to the conflicts. Whereas the chair of ASEAN therefore proposed to the party that observers be deployed along that boundary. So ICG, security councils, recognize and acknowledge the approach, the initiative the ASEAN has used. Said very clear. However, as ICG um, uh, report at that times that whereas this proposal was not into effects, I mean the tour of reference, uh, the observes cannot be deployed, part because party fails to agree on how it should be implemented. So another one that of course has been mentioned about um, the establishment of provisional demerit zones, uh, zones where the withdrawal of the troops uh, also required. So, as I say, I don't need to go ahead due to the, the time constraints because I already mentioned before about this proceeding and uh, what is the current situation. Because Indonesia, I again speak as Indonesia perspective, Indonesia's member of ASEAN countries always support and encourage any mechanism by both parties that could bring peace, building consensus and promoting stability in the regions. Of course, Indonesia always welcomed the recent development on the progress of a good relation between the two parties by creating a peaceful, stable, normal life and of course, um, interactions between the peoples around, uh, alongside the borders taking place uh, uh, in a very good uh, atmosphere at the moment. Indonesia is always standing ready to lend its support on peaceful settlements of the conflict stipulated in ASEAN principles. And of course, since the case now is in ICG, we sincerely hope whatever the decisions that each party will res respect this one. As already mentioned before also about the experience of Indonesia during, during the case of Sipadan Ligitan, uh, I have to mention about this one, it's not just a um, last, last resort. I mean, it is a last resort, of course, after we exhausted for almost a year's negotiate with Malaysia about the ownership of Sipadan Ligitan, when this kind of bilaterals with the principle of ASEAN, of course, exhausted, and then the two leaders at that time under President Suharto and Mahathir Muhammad, decided to bring the case to ICG and then decided whatever the decisions ICG has been made should be respected by the two sides and then which is we did. When the rulings for ICG you know, in favor of Malaysia that Sipadan Ligitan based on legal arguments that Sipadan Ligitan um, belong to Malaysia and then we respect that. So again, um, the challenges ahead if we're talking about ASEAN, that is approaching ASEAN Community 2015, which is everybody is very excited to have this, is that how to sustain the stability, the peaceful environments alongside the borders of Thailand, Cambodia, bearing in mind we still have pending issues about the ruling of ICG, where the speaker before me or make a draw lines. Um, numerous or various kind of scenario. This is we need to, to look at uh, closely in the time ahead, but of course, we have to op be optimistic in the spirit of brother, brotherhood and friendship between Thailand and Cambodia that has been existing for centuries for long and then has been expressed by many speakers, will be sustained in the time ahead. And then this is also the interest not only to to Thailand and Cambodia, but also the interest of ASEAN, the interest of the regions. Thank you very much once again, uh, Kapun Kap. Now, this is a forum to prepare the peoples for what is to come on the Thai Cambodian decision, and also to, compare, to prepare all the stakeholders from the different sectors about what is to come. This is a very politicized and polarized issue in Thailand. Uh, 
ASEAN has had a very difficult time dealing with uh, various disputes in its regions. I am a little bit uh, concerned that there is no mechanism really uh, in ASEAN that is going to be used or become effective in helping to resolve uh, this case. So it will be more or less bilateral. We have a short window for, for Q&A. Uh, let's just go to Q&A and, and uh, make some observations at the end. Uh, any questions, comments at this time? Uh, professors, uh, can I just a few seconds, a little bit? I just would like to repeat once again why Indonesia, and of course served by ASEAN, uh, emphasize the importance to maintain the stability and the peaceful ASEAN. I quote the statement by Foreign Minister last year. It says, it is essentially how we can ensure that the wider Asia Pacific region remain peaceful and remain stable. It is precisely the kind of conditions that ASEAN countries have enjoyed over several decades. A peace dividend, enabling ASEAN countries to have economic development. This is additional uh, statements I would like to make so that we, we know the context what Thank we are talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, when Indonesia was chair of ASEAN in 2011, that was one of the ASEAN's uh, finest hours. After that, we had the Cambodian chair last year, and we saw some, some fragmentation in ASEAN. Now it's Brunei, uh, and then will be uh, Myanmar next year. So the chairmanships of ASEAN uh, uh, you know, is an up and down process. We also have a new secretary general of ASEAN, uh, who's, not a, who's a former deputy former minister of Vietnam. And the role of the uh, secretary general is going to be also important uh, in this case. Q&A, comments? I think we'll take a round. My question would go, direct, would go directly to uh, Ajahn Phung Phong uh, about joint development. It seemed like you suggested this is the best solution for the conflict uh, for both countries. Uh, but to me, I think this is just, I don't have a best solution for that, but then I don't think it's, it is a best solution for the joint development because, well, uh, Maybe it impact for, it has the immediate impact at the moment, but what about for over generation? Because uh, we are still unclear uh, to which country is the ownership of the temple or the surrounding areas. So it would be uh, beneficial if you could elaborate on that. So, thank you. Could, could you just re rephrase or restate your your question again, please? Well. Uh, from your uh, presentation, uh, it seems the uh, joint development uh, over the temple is the best solution, right? And for me, I feel that uh, it's, it, it is not, maybe it has the immediate impact on both countries, but not, what about over generation? Whether it, whether it has the impact for generation to come uh, because it's still unclear over the ownership of the temple. Well, the, the, the ownership of the temple is clear. It belongs to Cambodia. But the joint development will happen in a disputed area, which both sides claim sovereignty over it. You see? So the joint development will happen in a disputed area only, while the temple itself, Thailand, we have to accept that it belongs to Cambodia. And also, uh, you mentioned a lot about the local politics in Thailand, and but in Cambodia, you mentioned only the reaction of the Prime Minister Hun Sen, but not the people. I mean, it a lot of issue, a lot of conflict in the country as well. So not only from the government, from the political side. So, uh, thank you very much. Can you tell us your name? Uh, are you a student here? My name is Farina, API Fellow, based at Chulalongkorn. From Cambodia, yeah. Yes. And what is the what are the sentiments of the Cambodian people apart from Prime Minister Hun Sen? Uh, because they maybe they misunderstand about the uh, the temp the ownership of the temple, but they usually say we build the house on our own land, <laughs> but then it has been brought to the you know to the ICJ, and then a lot of issues surrounding the area. You know, like it's, it's still you know like. Um, it will cause a lot of problems as well after the verdict uh, will be interpreted uh, in the coming days. So. 
Um, morning, Daniel Giles from Greens and Partners. Um, again, I'd like to thank uh, Ajahn Titinan and ISIS for organising this event. I've been looking forward to attend something uh, as informative as this about this uh, issue in Thailand for quite some time. And um, my question really speaks to that a little bit. And I guess it's mainly directed towards Ajahn Titinan and Ajahn Pung Tong because it's about the domestic political conflict in Thailand and how really it's, from my point of view anyway, the, the legal and the historical perspective is very interesting, but it seems that this issue is very much at the mercy of the ongoing domestic political conflict here. And we know manager media and ASTV and, 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 other, and maybe certain domestic NGOs are going to be spreading misinformation and promoting, stoking nationalist um, objection to a kind of reasonable settlement between the two countries however that's achieved but I, I, I do feel like whether or not the government gets enough uh, op the opposition gets enough traction to bring down the government is a little I, you know I think it's still pretty unclear and if I, if I was in this upper echelons of Pua Thai at this point I'd be I'd be actually trying to form a strategy to educate the public more broadly about why it's in the interest of Thailand to resolve this peacefully and so many economic developments along that border and especially uh, in the sea and under the sea can be uh, developed for the joint benefit of both countries so aside from Foreign Minister Surapong I think we agree is probably not the most uh, credible element uh, speaker, um, do you see uh, other uh, strategies moving towards the end of the year when we're probably going to get this decision? Do you see the government uh, will start educating the public, or there are other inch, there are other sort of uh, stakeholder groups that perhaps are not even seen as as aligned to the government, but on this issue would probably be promoting uh, promoting the same point that we should resolve this peacefully and thinking about significant Thai business interests and also some more responsible local NGOs and indeed you know uh, rational editors of newspapers. But I have assessed with this young uh, government in in trying to and, uh, to explain our political uh, give a political uh, explain uh, I mean, the Yingla government now just focus on economic development. They want to show that they are the efficient government which will bring prosperity to, to the country. But they are severely weak in uh, political, uh, what is it, uh, political uh, maneuver, including the previous here temple. And you see, Surapong stepped back so quickly after they got attacked from the, some mainstream media and, uh, and the nationalists. I think if the government wants to educate and prepare the, the public what the possible outcome we may face, then we have to bring in the more credible, eloquent speakers, such as the officers, high ranking officers from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, those who are involved in the, in the court case. I mean, but I understand that these uh, foreign ministry uh, officers, they are so concerned about their future. Go the governments come and go, but they still have to be there. And they are afraid of political uh, backfire if there was a chain, of, if there's a chain of government. But I mean, I still think that it's their duty to uh, protect Thai national interests mm. uh, based on, I mean, uh, mutual existing with the neighbor. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm wary to wade in uh, any further on this uh, saga. Uh, very quickly, I would say that uh, if you see establishment figures come out to say that we should respect international law, international institutions, and so on, and that's a good sign. There's a, a nationalist totality with royalist undertones surrounding this uh, politicized uh, saga on the Thai-Cambodian conflict, uh, which means that if you were to say that this is misinformation of the manager media group and so on, then eventually you would be labeled as a toxin supporter or a stooge of some kind. Uh, this totality means that you have to believe that the 4.6 belongs to, to Thailand and so on and so on. So this forum is, is also to, to inform you that, that this polarization is very much uh, uh, the overarching 
theme, uh, domestic Thai politics and the Prabhihan Prabhi is just a function of it. Uh, and it's the, I think, the task of, of other stakeholders. The government is compromised on this. I mean, you know, Thaksin Hun Sen, the, the whole politics of 2008. Government cannot do very much to prepare the people. I think it has to be civil society, sta other stakeholders, uh, including international um, stakeholders. The, the, the question is... Uh, please tell us your name, Dieter, and just uh, uh, Ande, I am a publisher here in Thailand. Um, the, um, the points are preparing the Thai people for a negative outcome or lose of territory. And uh, it seems to me uh, that this are, is a colonial thinking. Uh, um, interest of Thailand. But uh, uh, I think Ajahn Su made uh, his, his thinking, uh, what about the people? Uh, are the people not, uh, I mean it's a modern thinking that the people count and not really uh, the rulers in the center. And uh, uh, preparing people, would that not be a different set of thinking? I mean here uh, Thailand would lose territory. What does it mean? Who is Thailand? It's a, it's a rulers in Bangkok think so. What about uh, what, the, uh, what would the local people think? Would they feel, uh, do they have any feeling like that? And so uh, preparing something, would that not be um, a new kind of thinking that the people uh, are the important uh, factors and not certain interest groups in the center. And uh, normally col uh, colonialism is thought of outside powers, but uh, I consider Thailand a, um, a colonial empire ruled by Bangkok. And uh, so I see the, the conflict, red-yellow conflict, as a decolonization process that the, the local people want to be citizens and not subjects. And so what about thinking like this to, I mean, uh, in the first presentation it came as a mindset. So. Is that not, would that not be um, a starting point to prepare for the future? And not, it's not a, a short-term solution. First of all, I am very pleased by um, what Ajahn Vivid talk about the future of what, what gonna be in the future he, he want to see. Um, he said like, let respect the court, prepare people contractually, and one important thing is like the court decision must not please very please this side or this side but not very really harm this side and this side. But then I come to the question so the word the court itself is to find justice, it's not mediator. So in this respect I want to know your like is the the court the ICJ has like be a mediator rather than justice or justice rather than mediator? Thank you. Everybody is uh, very happy about the situation now. I mean, because the two sides have commitment to solve in a peaceful way, amicable way through bilaterals mechanism, joint border commission, and so on and so forth. But of course, there's still pending issue that everybody's waiting for, and where the speaker speaking? It's about the ruling of ICJ. Um, we're from a very optimistic and a, and a pessimistic uh, scenario, of course, everything is there. And very difficult to predict what the ICG's ruling is going to be. But I agree with them uh, that when two sides bring up the case to ICG, this time you surrender as part of your sovereignty to be ruled out by ICG. When, there is, when the case is ICG, there is no way you can't, you're going to interfere. This is the, the experience we have during uh, our case. 
about the Sipid, Sipadan Ligitan of uh, Coast of Kalimantan at that times after bilateral relations, uh, bilateral uh, dialogue negotiation has been exhausted and then we bring the case. And then it is exactly what he say. At that times, the arguments, part of the arguments the Indonesia games and also Malaysia is that the, the islands is a, a kind of the Indonesia's success of the Sultan Bulunga. It's one of the arguments. And then Malaysia is the success of the Sultan Sulu. And then, you know, ICG didn't reject all these arguments. They come up with the legal arguments by using the principles of uh, uh, effective occupations, not physically, but in the presence of the ordinance of the law regulation at that time, during the British time. And that's the verdicts. Uh, based on uh, legal arguments, not political arguments, of course. This is uh, as far as uh, our experience during dealing with ICG in this case. So, definitely, when the rulings uh, coming and they say, based on the principles of effective occupations, and then based on the legal arguments from both sides, the ICG is decided. The Sipadan Ligitan Islands belong to Malaysia. And then Indonesia accepted. Of course, there is a strong opposition from the public. That's why we engage by explaining the facts, not creating some kind of um, imaginary views to the public because the public sometimes cannot understand that. That's why we, we need to teach them, we need to educate in the very simple words, in the very simple expressions of uh, how to call it the views. And then, of course, uh, the people will understand. And then, thanks God, now uh, the situation is, is not uh, is not that it's difficult. But the most important thing is there is no single bullet come out of the barrel during this this time. And the second one also, uh, when we we deal with the Vietnam's to to establish continental selves, we have a negotiation about thirty years, and then finally we reach an agreement only to two thousand and three. This is the, the samples, this is the commitment as far as Indonesia's concerns about peaceful settlements of, of, of the conflict. That's, that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Chan Pong Tong. Uh, I would like to respond to this David question. Earlier, I reluctant to, to answer is because I don't have the quoted uh, message here. But uh, you see, um, even though in 1962 the, the court didn't uh, make a judgment on the frontier lines, but it said that they had to consider where the frontier line of the dispute was before it can make uh, a verdict uh, on whose territory the previous temple is in. You see, in order to to consider the the, the point that uh, who, who owned the the previous temple, they have to consider first where the frontier line. And the court make this uh, consideration. In its opinion, it said, Thailand in 1908 and 1909 did accept the annex one map as representing the outcome of the work of delimitation, and hence recognized the line on the map as being the frontier line. The effect of which is to situate previous temple temple in Cambodian territory. And there's another uh, 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 opinion about the watershed, uh, watershed line. As I remember, it says something like that both country has shown that it has uh, put greater importance on the line on the map than the watershed line. Therefore, both parties by their conduct, recognize the lie on the map, and thereby in effect agree to create guard it as being the frontier lies. In my opinion, the court in 1962 dismissed the watershed lie as a frontier lie. You see, but this opinion is not an operative cause, so Thailand is not authorized to uh, to do anything uh, uh, about the frontier lie. Yes, uh, I think. At this point, um, every people point finger to the government and say that the government have got to do something, have got to find a solution. But uh, if we can put this into reality, I don't think that the government is capable to do anything much. 
at least they're quite afraid that history might perhaps repeat itself. I think when it comes to this issue, we have got to accept the fact that it's not just simply the government issue, it's the public issue. So maybe if it would be very interesting if we could do some sort of public hearing. I would like to know how the Pumslong people, the, the people in that area would think about this problem. If there is a dead end, what sort of solution that they would like to see. I would like to see the public sector of the countries talk about this problem. I would like to see the media try to, you know, at least pray more, don't be afraid, but try to at least, uh, I, I think we need uh, sort of participation from, from people, uh, from, uh, you know, of different backgrounds, different area. We cannot just leave this to the decision of the government. Okay, that's, that's my first point. Second point, it is very important that we have got to bring this issue to be the regional issue, not the issue between Cambodia and Thailand. So the uh, ASEAN members should talk about this, should show that, that, that opinion more or less about this, not being afraid that is, is sort of uh, bilateral relations or conditions, but the effect it would affect that the future of ASEAN, destiny of ASEAN. So in reality, if something bad occurs, it uh, turned out to be the regional problem. It's not the problem between Thailand and Cambodian alone. And I think ASEAN have got to voice this. I think it's very important. That's, that's the first point I would like to make. The second point I would like to connect with what Ajahn Witted has left about the, the problem of history and historical writing. And I wonder if the conflict, suppose is the conflict between Thailand and Malaysia, would it turn out to be like this or not? But once it turned out to be the conflict between Thailand and Cambodia, I think is another story. So we have got to think that how the Thai think about Cambodian and how Cambodian think about Thailand, what sort of perception and understanding we have had toward each other. And I quite agree with Ajahn Vitit that uh, nationalist history more or less have some sort of put into the mind and the memory of the people concerning that sort of negative attitude of feeling toward our neighbor. But the point is that perhaps in the future, now we cannot write history of ASEAN, but because I don't think that is the, 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 the solution. I think the solution is national history. I think we need new national history. The history that we have ASEAN as part of us, we have our neighbor is part of us, and then the, the the point that we we become Thailand as what we are now is because we have good neighbor. It's what we have in our culture, in our system, ASEAN. And the reason that ASEAN move up to this point, Cambodian up to this point, is because they have Thailand. We have each other. And this is what it was in the history of the relationship between the you know, countries in ASEAN. But we actually forget this part of history. So we write history uh, in the context of nationalist history. So maybe if we have got to start from this, write a new national history. Thank you, uh, Professor Wittit, uh, for a uh, brief summary of uh, everything. Well, number one is that uh, if you understand, and I'm sure you do understand, that it's not just about the court case, and we started with the metaphor of the mind, you don't have to wait 
if you really want to do something. I came here because I didn't want to wait. I'm quite tired. I just came from refugee camps. But I came because it was a personal undertaking. And I wanted to come to rationalize with a constructive message. Just, just as I also went to an NGO forum, just was it yesterday or two days ago? On ASEAN too. It's a personal undertaking. You don't have to wait for ASEAN or anyone. Do it. In your capacity of the value added. I'm a humble academic. A humble academic who tries to study and use information in a rational way to catalyze constructively. Start with yourself, with ourselves. And today's proceedings are in English, but they need to be televised, radio, TV, in all languages of ASEAN. To do it, please. No need for copyright so much. Cut, chop in Cambodian, in local languages, in Bahasa, and so on. It's everyone's business if you really want to talk about peace in the region. Don't wait. Two. History, personal history, people's history, regional history. Too much indoctrination, I'm afraid. We haven't been teaching history. Too much indoctrination in so many countries, most countries. Whose victory anyway? Where's the people's victory, so to speak? People's histories. It's not history, it's histories. Have to be recorded, shared, discussed. Today we've heard a bit, we haven't heard enough. We've heard a bit. We want to hear local people, the frontier people, their histories. Where they converge, where they diverge. Where the history of the peace, the histories of the peace, have been built already and can be built. And where we have conflicts, humans have conflicts. We deal with them peacefully, not militarily. Thirdly, a reference to ASEAN. Of course we look to ASEAN, we admire ASEAN. But if you see this issue as a people's issue, where is the people's ASEAN? You look at the ASEAN Charter, I was at a forum two days ago. All the institutions in the ASEAN Charter are about government, particularly the executive. There's no people's institution in the ASEAN Charter, except in the annex, like the ASEAN Kite Council. And what does that mean anyway? We need an ASEAN Parliament. Put it on the table, please. ASEAN Parliament. We need civil society forum recognized by ASEAN, where we can share our feelings peacefully, accommodate them peacefully. If you just leave it to the executive, it will never be an ASEAN for the people. And ASEAN will never have the leeway to discuss these issues properly, adequately, from a people-based angle. It's not impossible, it is very possible. That's why I put on the table in Myanmar, in front of Do Aung San Suu Kyi two months ago, and the government people, that. Burma, Myanmar can also lead by advocating people's participation. I'm very much confident about it. Burma, Myanmar should also lead by advocating the need for people's assembly as well as civil society forum in ASEAN properly. Fourthly, court proceedings in The Hague have to be disseminated webcast, translated, prepare for it please. Don't just leave it to the English language, it's not even Dutch, it's English, or the international languages. Prepare to disseminate court proceedings in the various language, web languages, consistently, now, through a variety of media. Get it onto the internet, get it onto TV, radio, etc. Immediately. <coughs> Don't leave it to others. And then finally, my friend, the International Court of Justice is a means to an end. It's not an end itself. And it's a, it has a variety of tools, like all courts. It can mediate. Parties can withdraw their case as part of mediation, like any court. But in this case, I think at least one party wants finality. That's why it's going to be at court judgment. It's never too late to withdraw. Or it can adjudge. And when it adjudges, of course it looks to justice, it promotes justice. And in our case, 
Maybe even shared justice. Maybe even shared justice. Justice does not mean that one person wins alone. It can also be a shared situation. We have to all about uh, the Singapore-Malaysia case. Mischief, uh, is it Middle Rocks? Middle Rocks. Mischief Rocks something else. <laughs> Middle Rocks case. That's shared. In the, uh, not Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, you know, one part, party gets this, the other party gets this. So it doesn't have to be one person, one government, one state wins alone. Yeah, that's what I want to say. So um, look to a variety of options, but always peaceful options. And ultimately, it is not just a tangible exercise of the materiality of the temple. How and what the temple should inspire us to do is to transcend that materiality towards peace in the minds of ASEAN peoples as a whole through our histories together now and for the future. Thank you. I want to thank also uh, the Frederick Nauman Stiftung who has sponsored us today. Uh, ISIS is interested in doing a people to people, to bilateral people to people forum. So we'll look for a sponsorship for that, uh, getting people from both sides to, to be at the same place, same time. Our next event is next Friday, uh, 29th, on Asia-Pacific Security and the U.S. Pivot to Asia. If you're interested, uh, please contact the ISIS office. Uh, and please uh, thank you for coming, uh, for joining us today, all of you. And uh, please join me in thanking all the speakers today. Thank you.